is the secret to success. Self-discipline is everything. I'm going to show you how great I am. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. What are you going to do? We are recording, which means we are live for the very first episode of the Train Aid Performance Podcast. Now, today we've got a very special guest. We've got Mr. Jamie the Hooligan Malarkey, fresh off his first round TKO victory uh, over in Las Vegas. Jamie, thanks for coming on, my man. Thank you. Thanks for having us, mate. Yeah, first episode, mate. We are just saying off air there that this was a bit of a sporadic uh, decision to start recording. I've actually wanted to do like a train aid podcast for a long time. And then I thought I was just sitting here the other day in quarantine and thought, you know what, what better time to do it than right now. Ordered a, ordered a microphone, came within 24 hours and then another 12 hours <laughs> later, we got the first episode going. So yeah. here we are. Sick idea. It's got nothing, nothing better to do, man. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Now you're in uh, hotel quarantine, as am I. How are you finding it? You're uh, you're across town to where I am, but how are you holding up in quarantine? Yeah, man, it's all right. It's fucking can be can be rough, but I uh, found the first few days went pretty quick, and then now they're sort of stretching out just a little bit more every day. It's just like, but it is what it is. Yeah, but that's exactly it. Right. Eh? It is what it is. Yeah. That's like what everyone says. But man, it is. It's like like we were saying off air. Then it can play games with your mind if you don't keep yourself busy. Hey, like because it's just I don't think anyone like really appreciate. You think about your day and what you do. Even if you work in an office nine to five, you go out for your lunch break. You go out for like morning tea. You're on like yeah. to and from work. You go to a bus and like you you don't you take that for granted being able to go outside get fresh air move around and, and yeah. just do what you want to do and then like you're stuck in a room like you guys got a pretty good room i reckon my room is probably the size of half of my living room back home and it's just like uh, you, you can walk around the whole thing in maybe like five steps five, te- five to six air? steps no and we don't have a window that cracks here so it's like Wow. It's crazy, man. Like how it could play mo- like mind games with you if, you if you're not keeping yourself busy. Yeah, that's that's harsh, bro. So you got no fresh air in your room. Yeah, no, no window. See if I can get a video of it. At least in the last one that I had, like the window cracked just a just a little bit, so you could get like a little bit of that fresh air. But yeah, we got nothing yeah. now. But hey, it is yeah, what it is. Making, like you said. Yeah, it's making um like fighting <clears throat> just that bit more challenging, eh? Like more obstacles, more fucking, more things that you have to go through. Because like I was talking to the boys and it kind of kills your buzz as well. Like I'm I'm coming off like a, a first round knockout feeling buzzed and like that first week after your fight, that's when you want to like just enjoy it because we got to get yeah, back to yeah. training. Like this two week hotel quarantine kind of kills that buzz. Uh, it's, um, is what it is, I guess. But is that something you think about when you're, when you're taking fights now, because this is your second time you've had to do it. You did it in fight Island last year and then you come back into the two weeks and this is the second time you've gone through it. I guess like you don't really have an option, but does it go through your head where you're just like, man, shit, I've got to do this quarantine again. I've got to like, Oh, like I wish, Blah blah blah. Does it? What's your thought process when you a fight comes up, knowing all of this is is got to happen afterwards? Yeah, well, like you said, it's only my second time, so I think next time I'm gonna be think like dreading it a little bit more again because it's like it's still sort of new. But <clears throat> yes and no. Like you do think about it, but <clears throat> you you think about fighting first. You you get off at a fight and you you still get those little those little like little bit of a uh, buzz when you when you get offered a fight and um so you, you obviously take it but yeah now it, it kind of more hits you when you are doing your quarantine i think when you're actually doing it you're like fuck but <laughs> i think now like while i'm in here I'm, I'm going yeah next time i'm going to be dreading this that little bit more and it makes it hard like for me it's not just myself doing it it's my coach yeah, like you're, yeah. you're, I'm, I'm taking him away from his family, and his, and and his life for four weeks, for my yeah, benefit. True. Like for, like it's our benefit too. He wants me to win. He wants me to, and we, and we did. So like, 
fucking thank God. But it's like, yeah, it's 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 more for me <clears throat> having to drag someone else through this. It's um, it just makes it more challenging, man. It makes it a lot more challenging than just leaving uh leaving new country, leaving home for ten days, fighting, coming back. That's a piece of piss. But this whole process is uh it makes it a lot harder and um for me it's it's like if I was doing it by myself, that's a bit better, but I'm actually making someone else do it with me, so <clears throat> it's just one of those things, eh? Yeah, that's a good point too. It's crazy too. And people don't appreciate that. It's like when people go away for UFC fights, like you guys take a corner. Like, man, like we, we roll pretty deep. Like when we go away, like I'm the dietitian. I somehow managed to, to get in on it. Mm-hmm. But like people take a whole team away. But now that there's this whole COVID situation, you know, you've got to get a governor general pass to leave the country. You've got to get all these weird approvals, yeah, and man. everything else. So it's like even for you guys taking corners, which are your coaches, which are, you know, guiding you through this whole process, guys that you've been with for years, sometimes it's just not plausible, eh? Like, I remember you and I were talking about, like, it, it just wasn't That's plausible what I'm for, yeah, for that, Ross to come yeah. and back you. And Ross has been your coach. So it's like, it, it's a strange dynamic for you guys. Like, yeah, you want to go over and fight, but you want to keep it as normal as possible, get all your team around. But because of COVID and everything, that's just not possible. It's not possible to be normal. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. It's like, it's making it uh, like harder to to continue to fight because you can't I can't even keep expecting like like you said Ross he's running a business back home he's got a gym that he's got to run so like how can I keep every time I fight go ah oh, man Ross are gone for another four weeks he can't afford he can't physically afford to do that so um yeah it's 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 interesting I'm gonna be like my plan moving forward I think is just getting who I can like to come with me uh who's available who's willing to to do the whole process yeah man, it's and it's crazy bro because you think about your situation too like man i don't know did you even cop a punch did you cop a shot in that last fight and like maybe like a couple uh, yeah. And, but like yeah one you, i think one job yeah like you're pretty much unscathed it's the ufc turns around and goes hey man like we got to fight for you in four weeks time you could you could stay fit and you could keep your weight good and you could probably turn around fast and do it but then it's like oh man can i actually do it because can i get a whole team i've got to go home i've got to do two week quarantine and then i've got to find a coach to come with me and go back it's just like it stops that possibility as well yeah yeah no it does it makes it a little bit harder man um because, yeah, exactly what you're saying. I'd be down. I'd be down. But it's can I get someone else to do that again? Because it's a massive ordeal, man. It is. Yeah, it is. <coughs> but uh, anyway, Jamie, let's go on to talk about that fight. First uh, first win in the UFC octagon. And, like, far out. That was, like, classic hooligan, right? Talk us through it. What was, uh, what was going through your head going in that fight? You released that footage of you and Ross drilling that same sequence where you fake the, fake the two and come back with the three and come through. Talk us through that fight. What was going through your head, like getting in the prep? What was going through? Was it like do or die for you? Talk us through. What was going through your head? Yeah, it was a really good camp. Um, I went down and trained with a uh, freestyle fighting gym uh, down with Alex Volkanovski. So we... Uh, we trained together for the fight. Um, I think it was about seven, seven or eight weeks uh, down there. And you know the their workload, Jordy. It's a yeah. it's a heavy workload. So it was definitely um, physically is the best I've felt going into a fight. So that brought me a lot of confidence going in. And um, yeah, the whole build up, like we knew uh, this was a, a pretty much a do or die fight. <clears throat> just going off my last uh, two fights. I, I didn't have bad fights, but I just come up the short end of a decision. So it put me in a in a pretty, like, pressuresome situation. And I felt the pressure leading up, but it was weird. Uh, like, the closer the fight got on fight week, I, I was getting, like, more and more confident. Um, just, I don't know what it was. It was, like, just just the closer it was getting, the better I was feeling, the more more comfortable I was feeling being there. Um, and 
by the time uh, fight night came, I was just I was just ready to go, man. So um, when I got in there, I'd, I'd, I I expected it to go uh, longer than it did. Obviously, like it, most people don't expect their fights to be uh, a knockout finish in under a minute. But um, the uh, the the game plan was to start hard on this guy, um, get him get him biting on my shots because we knew that he was like a, a really hard counter striker. And he's fast, man. He's been a, around a long time. So I thought it was going to go uh, a little further and me just being able to mix it up on this guy was going to get me the win and probably probably a, a finish would open up. I wasn't sure what it was going to be, but I, I thought that a finish would present itself maybe like round two. Uh, I don't know. Like I, was, uh, I just didn't think it was going to be that quick. But, um, yeah, it, it just came out. Came out real good, man. But like, just felt fast, felt agile, felt uh, like very comfortable in there. Like I said, so couldn't ask for a better result, really. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You talk about then about <clears throat> the confidence and how you got more and more confident as time went on. You got closer to the fight. Why is that? Why is that? If you hang around fighters long enough, you notice all you guys like that. You guys have this supreme confidence and this aura about you guys. Was that always the case with you? Have you always been like that? Or is that something that's like developed as your career's gone on? Or what's going on? Well, every fighter, exactly like you say, will tell you like, like the, I think the biggest thing that a fighter um, has to have, they, like you, he, he feeds himself well, he trains hard, he does all the, ticks all the boxes. But the number one thing, in my opinion, is you have, he has to believe. Yeah. He has to believe in himself because up here, that's that's where it all starts. That's where it all comes from. And if you you could have the best camp in the world, have feel the best you've ever felt, but if you walk into that cage and you're you've got this little bit of doubt, we all get that little bit of doubt. But you got to shut that shit off. You got to go no, like I'm 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 gonna win this fight. Um, so in my opinion, that's that's the biggest thing. And for me, what what gives that to me? Uh, the most is the people I'm around. Mm. Uh, like, you, for instance, like my coaches, Noah Magnus and Ross Pearson, coming over with you guys, like having you in my corner, all these little, because at this level, you have to have every single thing, like all these little, what am I trying to say? Like all these little 1%. So, all these little things at this level are going to make the biggest difference. And for me on fight week, especially that was, that was the biggest thing for me, just giving me so much confidence, just um, the, the people that were around me and knowing that I was doing everything right. And I know I've got what it takes to, to get the job done. So that was probably it for me. Yeah. Me and uh, Volker had an interesting combo when we were away and talking about, how he became the person that he is. And anyone that knows Volk is like, he's a, he's a real leader, right? Like he, and he thrives in difficult and challenging situations, always steps up to the mark. And same with all yeah. you guys, right? Like you've just, you thrive in, in adversity and you overcome it. But we are talking about, you know, there's no real set time or set event that's really like molded or, or shaped this specifically. It's just a bunch of little events over years and years and years that have made him the person he is. Let's wind it back and let's go back to the early days and let's unfold it. Like, how did we get to the Jamie Malak that we had today? Talk us through when you started fighting. Like, how did you come across? Were you playing other sports and then say you got an injury and then you went into pancreation or whatever it is you started on? How did it all start on this journey? Yeah, no, I, um, I was playing rugby union uh, when I was like 13 <clears throat> and... I was always getting heaps unfit in the off season of rugby. <laughs> so I wanted something to do to keep fit. That was literally it. That was why I started mixed martial arts. I didn't want to become a fighter. I didn't want it like, I don't know. And funnily enough, I just got good at it and got stuck in the sport. Like mm. that's literally how it happened. Um, Cause I was always pretty coordinated, pretty like handy at most sports that I've done. I, I love sports. I was always sporty, but I never had like a work ethic either. I never yeah. wanted to fucking do sprints. I never like if it was a hard, 
if it was a hard training session, I'd, I might have a sore leg that day, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so, but then that's, that's like the beautiful thing that fighting gave me. It made me want to work harder because um, it's so demanding, man. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd, in the off-season of rugby, I was watching The Ultimate Fighter. I was like, this, sick, this shit's fucking cool. I want to go try it out. Um, and then I threw a kid in an arm bar in my second session, like we were having a, a wrestle in front of the whole class and I just learned how to do an arm bar, threw him in an arm bar from the mount and was like, this, this is sick. Like I, I never went back to footy. So, and um, then like about a year later, uh, I got offered my first fight. Um, Noah just came up to me and um, just said, hey, you want to fight in, in four weeks in the cage? Uh, amateur rules and I was like okay <laughs> yeah, why not? I'll give it a go um, so that's where it all started and then just as time went on, went on just become more and more in love with it got better and um, yeah man that's, that's, how, that's how old were you how old were you when this is all starting off when you made that swap from footy over to fighting uh, 14 14 yeah 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 so and I was one of the ones that didn't start with like um like most fighters start have a, a start in martial art, you know what I mean? Like yeah, started yeah. in boxing, started in wrestling. I I just went straight into mixed martial arts. Um, Jason Siebert was my my first ever trainer, um, and he was just running like a youth a youth fight fit program with uh, like young kids, and um that's where I started and then met Noah through, through Jason and took off from there. So, so you're a 14 year old kid. You're doing what we all do off season footy, eating crap, not training to party, doing yeah. whatever. And you go, okay, I need to get this in under wraps. You start training and then you start training. Is it at 14 and then four weeks later you have your first fight? So you're what, 14, 15 when you had your first fight? Yeah, I was 15. So I'd been training for like a year. And then yeah. um, just got offered a, a fight. So, yeah, that's that's where it came up. Yeah, talk us through that. What was that like, like going through your head? Like, was it something that you were like, okay, oh, this is, I know, yeah. like, I know this is what I want to do. Or was it just, ah, shit, we'll just give it a go and see what happens? Yeah, no, I was shit scared, man. I was fucking <laughs> scared out of my life. Um, I said, yeah, and I was pumped. And then I remember walking out and I was like, there's this clip that I used to watch from Mike Tyson. And he said that he wanted to, he was actually, because Mike Tyson's such a loose unit, he was thinking about um, running down the stairs out of the stadium and getting a train home. And just, he, he was thinking about doing that. And I was seriously thinking when I, I heard my opponent's music come on, my opponent was walking out and I was like, fuck, I, I really don't want to do this. <laughs> I was so scared, man. But then that's um, that's one of the things. That's it. the best thing about fighting. You overcome that fear. You overcome that fear and you get in there and you fucking do it. Like you, you surprise yourself. I still surprise myself. It, like I, I go, fuck, like you, 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 you can do more than what you think. Yeah, yeah. Man, yeah, because that's, that's something I wanted to go into is – how did this get easier or did it get easier as you kept going and kept racking in the, the amateur fights and then eventually made you pro? Did it get easier to go in there or were you always thinking that same mindset? Like, man, this is scary as shit. Like, I could go get hurt. Nah, or what goes through your mind? For sure, it gets easier because that, like, that experience um, and the confidence, the confidence is key. So, when you win and fights and you get more confident, you, you're like, no, I'm like, I'm, I can do this. So it has, it gets easier and more comfortable for sure. Maybe not everyone's like that. Like maybe other people are just fucking heaps more um, savage. I don't know, but that's how I was. I was like scared out of my, scared out of my life. And I think most people will be lying if they say that they're not scared going in for their first cage fight. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you're like you 15 need that years fear old. Too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, need, you need that fear as well to wake yourself up. Like your nerves are good, man. I I think that uh, 
even at this level, nerve, like the nerves are good. It's just how you control it. Yeah, yeah. What was it like when you were like 15 and then you were coming up? Did you slowly develop? Did you, what I want to ask is what influence did doing this have on you coming up as like a 15 year old kid? Whereas like most 15 year old kids are out shit kicking party and doing whatever and, and, and everything else. What influence did fighting have when you were growing up, going through that period of your life? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Cause like that's, that's what it did for me because I said to you before, I was never like a standout in any sport. <clears throat> so um, I was always like pretty okay. Like played soccer, basketball, cricket, footy. And then with fighting, it I was good at it. So I got like so fucking dedicated to it that at that age, I was like not really going out partying and, um, doing what most kids are doing I was I was more just training like all the time I was just obsessed with it because I was I was pretty good at it and I thought I was a little badass too like but you, uh, being that age showing showing my mates my, my knockout on the weekend is like you, you think you're a little mad mad dog so um that kept me motivated to just uh give it my all and train hard because um I was enjoying it and I I got really good at it and thought, fuck, this is something that I can actually really excel in. What What were your friends and family like? Were they supportive of it, or did they know much about it? Or what was when yeah, you had that conversation? Um, you were like, I'm doing this. What did the, What was the common response? Yeah, the, like people were pretty interested in it because, um, especially where I'm from, the Central Coast, not many kids like fighting. Um, at the, sort of at the level I was fighting, I guess. I don't know. But, yeah, most the, the common reaction from, like, your mum, they're, they're pretty scared. They're, like, your first family's, like, pretty scared and pretty nervous for you. Um, one of the funniest things, like, that <laughs> my dad said to me, I was watching, um, who was it, Diego Sanchez versus Clay Guida. We all remember that fight. Yeah, yeah, and it was just a, a like a barn burner of a fight, absolutely nuts from bell to bell. And I was sitting down watching it with dad, and dad was just looked at me and goes, You couldn't do this, Jamie. You'd take one smack on the mouth, and you'd take one smack on the mouth, and you'd, you'd run off crying. And that just <laughs> fucking triggered something in me, and I was just like, Oh, you wait, you fucking wait. There's you but, wait like, out. Yeah, mate. It was it was the best thing he could have said. Best thing he could have said to me. So it just triggered my little um my little fucking fuck you in me to just go. I'll show you. But um, it, it like my family's so supportive, man. My my friends and family are like they're like the reason why I do it. You know, they get me motivated. Get me um on the days that I want to train. I just think about how, how many people support me and get behind me. Um, and my family are, are, have been like my number one supporters from day one. Yeah, that's what I wanted to deep dive into next because every fighter I work with and every fighter that I'm mates with, and we always have this conversation when we're unpacking how they got to where they are today. It seems that there were multiple times they were almost at a crossroads where it was like, okay, I finished high school, everyone's going to university, but I'm going to do you know, the road less traveled by and I'm going to do fighting or they were, you know, at a job they weren't happy with. And they said, you know what, like, I can't keep doing this. I'm going to just fully commit to fighting. Were there certain times in your life when you're going through that you're at those crossroads and you're like, okay, like I need to make a call. Am I going to do this full time and be really serious about it? Or do I go back? Yeah, for sure. Like, no, nah, there definitely was those, those times. Um, I always worked while I was training. So it was more, um, but again, the further I went into working and training, like it's pretty hard, pretty hard yards, um, getting up before work and trying to train. And um, because I worked as a plumber, so we were, you know, big days on the tools, starting early. Um, and there was times where I was like, fuck, do I, do I stick with plumbing or do I go, go into this full time um and yeah and, and the, it, it 
I think you still like you, you still get those like questions in your own head because uh, you've got so much time to think about it. But you've just got to like think about what you want and go go fuck. I want to do this, and I think I can. That's where the belief comes in as well. So you were working as a full time plumber. So you did your apprenticeship, and then you got signed off and you were working full-time and then training a full-time training load as well yeah yeah pretty much how, how long were you doing that for uh i did that for best part of seven years seven or eight years whoa yeah yeah so seven years and, and where were you at in your fight career during this day? Did you have, were you a professional or were you still an amateur or where were you at? Nah, so the whole time wasn't like training like a full-time athlete. And the difference between now and then is even still big. Uh, like from when I was like, because I started as an amateur. Um, did my, started my plumbing apprenticeship when I was 17. So I was training like, you know, once a day through my amateur days. And then when I turned pro, I'd be trying to up the training more. So when I I turned pro when I was 19, so then I was pretty much training and and working, like trying to fit the both in like full time uh, from when I was about like 20, 20 years old or something like that. So that's probably about six years of doing that. All right, so six years. So let's talk about like, what is it? You touched on it before with your family and it being a big motivation for you and a big drive, but that's a long time. Six, seven years is a long freaking time. Like people listening, think about how old you are now, minus six, seven years, and think about what you're doing. Like your life is chalk and cheese, but throughout that whole time, you're pretty much narrowed in on this goal. Was that always the goal? Okay, I want to get to the UFC. I want to do this and I want to get it. What motivated yeah. you and kept you going to get that, get to that point? Yeah, it was it was tough. Like there's times where you just like fuck, like do I do I keep going along it? But um, I think the thing that motivated me was like how well I was doing, and then all my all my like people around me in my in my life that were telling me like you're gonna do it, you're gonna do this, you're gonna make it, and um, it was always my dream. So I wanted it bad. That was that that was it. Um, I always saw myself fighting in the ufc which is most fighters goals did you have like a a a routine that you had like every day like talk us through what it was when you were like working as a plumber full-time like what was your daily routine for those six seven years so i would try to um i would try to get up and do like three three of those mornings uh of the days i was working i'd try to get up and go like run one day uh strength and conditioning like a little circuit push um and maybe pads or or like bag work or something on the on the third day so we're talking like they're probably like 4 a.m workouts um and like i I had a mate that i was living with um kirky he's like my best mate so he was getting up doing these workouts with me fucking legend like getting me up and getting me motivated to to train and he didn't have flights coming up he was just doing it like more it. for me and with me to give me a hand and, and help me get going so um then just tr- go i'll literally get off uh the freeway from work <clears throat> and just go train uh straight to training every day so they were big days um kind of leaving it you know leaving it five five thirty getting home at like seven jesus yeah and you did that all through and so when you were working you were still competing how often were you fighting how often were you were you competing uh i was like no it wasn't like crazy but it was at when i was pro i was trying to get about four four fights a year so and but when i say four fights a year like you know um that's that's a fair bit of time dedicated like i wasn't just taking fights on a week's notice there would be like a camp behind every one of those fights so um 
yeah, like uh, most most people know that for a fighter, four fights a year is a pretty busy year. Yeah, so it's basically half a year, six months of a year, just prepping and competing in fights. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, where was the point where you were like, I'm going to make this and I'm going to do it in UFC? Or where was the point where it was like, the UFC is an attainable goal? Was there like a moment in your pro career where you were like, okay, I can actually make this and I can make that next leap and make it to the big leagues and, you know, I can probably do this and, and flip my plumbing job and I can do this full time. Was there a yeah. moment where it just kind of hit you and that was a reality? Uh, not really like a certain moment. It's just that belief that you always sort of have um, just based on my performances and how I was going. Um, that was that was just always in my head that, that I will make it. And probably actually when I went to my first UFC event and I was watching them live, I was like, man, I can, I can fucking do this. Like, there's no, there's no difference between these guys and, and me and what I'm doing. Like, so yeah, when I went to my first UFC event, that was, um, that was a big like sort of belief, uh, kicked up my, my self belief, you know? What about this on the other side of the coin? Were there any times during this process before you got to the UFC where you're just like, man, F this? Like, man, I don't want to do this anymore. This is too hard. Like, what a waste of time. What am I doing? Did you ever have those type of doubts or any big moments where you're like, nah, this isn't for me? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think I really had that. Um, maybe when I, when I ran into bulk, that was a fucking... I was like, fuck, because I was 9-0 and and I thought, um, Alex, uh, we got off the fight and I was like, yeah, I can do it. Um, and like most people were dodging Alex at that stage in the Australian yeah, yeah. circuit. And it was sort of hats off to both of us from a lot of people because he was 11-1, and one, I was 9-0. and o, And a lot of guys at that sort of, when they're on the brink of maybe getting a, a contract into a big organization, they're, they're trying to keep their record padded. Yeah, they're yeah. They're picking empty fights. Uh, I think you see it less these days because I, I reckon the talent's so, so fucking good in Australia so at the deep, moment. Eh? Um, yeah, that you, you sort of can't even do that these days. But um, yeah, that, so I accepted the fight and then he handed me my first loss and that was like, hit me pretty hard. Um, so just a, a bit again, overcoming adversity. It's it's what literally, as corny as it sounds, like you learn so much from the losses. Like yeah. that that I I believe they make you so much stronger. I'm actually like more scared of like I'm um, I'm I'm less nervous about an undefeated guy in some respects because they haven't overcome that adversity. They haven't. Um, they haven't dealt with that and and beca- like made them like so much stronger, you know. Is it easier then to come back from a loss? Is it easier to find motivation to get back in the gym and to get back on the wagon after a loss oh, than it is a win? A hundred percent. For me, it was it like lit a fire under me so much. Not that I like lost the fire, but it just like coming off of a loss, you're so much more um, not leaving any stone unturned, you know what I mean? You're just, you just like really backs against the wall sort of thing. So that was sort of like how I was for that last uh, that last fight. Yeah, yeah. What, what goes through your mind, Jamie? Like kind of want to unpack it when you do get handed a loss. Like talk about like your first fight like with Brad and, and we'll get Brad on and you two to talk about because I've heard both of you guys talk about it. And especially when we've had like a couple of beers, it's probably the funniest conversation yeah. ever. You guys talk, but <laughs> that was quite possibly one of the best and closest fights I've ever watched. It could have gone either way. And it's probably one of the only fights that I've seen other than one really strange one in China that wasn't that good, but where you guys literally emptied your gas tanks. You guys had nothing left. You guys emptied and then you went to the reserve tank and you emptied that. And then you went to some weird place mentally and then emptied whatever you guys had there 
like literally like you guys are on your hands and knees at the end of the fight, still trying to hit each other, like crazy, yeah. crazy stuff. Like <clears throat> how, how do you get to a place where you can do that? Because watching that, it's not normal. Like normal people watching that won't understand where you've got to go and what you've got to dig through to get, get to that place. What's it like going there when you're competing, when you're fighting, when you've got to dig deep? Like, is something going through your mind or is it just something that you've just drilled into yourself through training or what is it? Yeah, man, I don't think anything's going through your mind when you get to that state. And I've never got to that state before. So, like, it's, uh, I think it's um, like that old saying, it takes two to tango. Yeah, I yeah. think, yeah. like, you get lucky when you get a fight like that and an opponent like that and you've showed up, he's showed up and both guys will so strong that you're not going to let anything uh, stop you. So it, it's pretty, it's pretty special when you get that, I, I think. And it was just lucky that both me and Brad UFC debut, we got the right dance partner, you know, and we just fucking let it, let it all out in there. Yeah, and that and that fight, like, let's talk about that fight. Even before you guys got into the cage, it was the highest selling event in UFC history down in Melbourne. Was yeah. it? Was it at? Uh, what was it? Eddie had? Was it at Eddie had? Where was it? Where did we have that one? Marvel. Marvel. Marvel that's right. Marvel Stadium. It was. Um. Yeah. When yeah. Israel fought Rob, and then um, yeah. what was that like? What was that experience like? Walking out to near on sixty thousand oh, fans, man. screaming UFC it, debut. It What's that like? All- it was all so fast, man. It was so cool, eh? Like, cause it, I, I got like the the way it happened. I got the fight and had three weeks to to get to prepare or whatever. I was training, like I wasn't like just coming off the couch. So it wasn't like I'm not trying to use that as as an excuse or anything. But the experience all happened so fast, and it was so yeah. cool, eh? Like going on that card for, for all them years like working up to it <clears throat> then seeing my name even if it was, like on the undercard just seeing my name up there up next to Rob Whitaker, Israel Adesanya it's like fuck man there's like crazy uh, magnitude behind it and um, walking out into those people that was another funny thing that I always I, I didn't hear it at the time I was just zoned in at the time, but you couldn't even see the cage. You could like, it was just like a wall of people that you had to go through because it was at um at Marvel Stadium, such a huge stadium. And um, I walked past some of the city kickboxing gym, it must have been, I, I'm yeah. guessing, because I just heard like heaps of fucking yelling and I heard, because my brother was standing behind me filming on his phone. And it yeah, shows yeah. me going past these people and it just hears, you just hear this, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the back. I fucking love that. I love that. It's uh, like passion, whether you're with me or against me, I fucking love it. So um, that was pretty cool. So yeah, the whole experience, man, it's just unreal. What was it like winding it back to the three weeks before you made the walk when you got the call? All of these years, seven years working as a plumber, training, fighting, balancing life. You know, another four years before that, amateur balancing footy and, and fighting and amateur fights and whatnot. So pretty much like 11 years of work. All up in that moment, you get that phone call when whoever calls you and tells you or you get the email. Talk us through, like, how did that unfold? How did you find out and what did it feel like? Yeah, it was um, pretty like, pretty fucking pumped me up obviously so we were ross pretty much showed me um a message from sean shelby saying that they were going to go in for a meeting uh to see if they want to do brad riddell versus jane malarkey so that was the first little like uh whiff that i got so then we pumped it up a bit more and i put up another post like with me and brad um, just saying, like, let's fucking make this this fight happen just to give it that little bit more of a push. And then I was working um, one morning on site, like this three weeks before the fight, <clears throat> and I was working up in up in Newcastle on this on this house and got the call uh, from Ross 
just saying we're fighting in three weeks. And it was just like, oh, it was just the, the best feeling ever, really. It was, it was literally the best feeling, um, best feeling I could get. How, how, so much, what did, what did, so what did you do? Like, were the people around you? Did you say, were you jumping? Were you in your own head? Like, did you have to take an early smoker or what, what goes yeah, on? Yeah, like? mate. hundred <laughs> percent. It was an early smoker. I was pretty much telling the boss to fuck off. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I made it. Nah, it was, yeah, man. Nah, I just, I just went, no, had a pretty much a 20 minute phone call with, uh, with Ross. Um, and then, yeah, just, uh, started figuring out what I had to do and uh, getting my shit ready to, to go down to Melbourne and punch on. So you just packed up, like you got the phone call. Did you just hang up and say, see your boys, like finish the work nah, yourselves nah, and just grab the gym bag? Or... <laughs> 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 no, I worked the rest of the day. I worked that day, but I pretty much told my boss. I, I called my boss and said, yeah, mate, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fighting in a couple of weeks in the UFC. Um, and he drove out to the site. He was like around, so he drove out to the site and um, come up and had a chat with us about it. So, yeah. How good? How good? So, um, I guess let's let's go through this. So you had that fight with Brad. What happened after? You obviously had that barn burner fight. You walked away with a performance bonus. Like you said, you you lost lost the fight, but I think there was real no loser in that fight. Like I, I remember we were watching it. We were obviously working that event down there and everyone in the room was just looking at each other, like their jaws on the floor. Like, Oh my God, yeah, like, saying, yeah. like man, we, when are these guys fighting next? Like we got to watch these guys again. Like this is the best thing ever. Like you never, you don't lose in a fight like that. You would have gained so much fear. What went through your head when you like, obviously afterwards pack down, relax, you know, warm down, whatever, and go out, hang out, family and friend. What goes through your mind after that? Was it like, and I finally made it or what's going through your head? Yeah, look, it was um, definitely like, like you said, that there sort of was no loser. Um, it, it wasn't the decision I wanted, uh, but like he, he definitely won the fight in, in my opinion, but it showed me uh, that I belong there. Like, yeah, because Brad's a world-class fighter. I fought him and I believed that I could beat him and we, we had a crack over the fight. So that was what it did for me. When it when the dust settled and kind of like came off that cloud nine feeling, um, it just like made me so motivated to to go again and just go, look, I'm, I'm here now. Now it's time to, to really pull the trigger and uh, give it my all. So that was the first time that I quit my job and started training full time literally to the point where I made it to uh, like a platform where I've, I felt like I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's two things I want to go, but first, while we're just on that topic of your, you of your debut and a lot of people, not just like my UFC athletes that I work with, a lot of them have said this, but a lot of people in every other industry, people in my industry, people in, in, in other business and whatever is this imposter syndrome that people feel when they get, to you know that whatever that destination is they've been thinking of for years and working towards they finally get there and they go shit do i belong here is this you know am i ready for this did you experience the imposter syndrome when you're getting ready for this fight or when you're walking out did did you experience it all nah like uh, that was like i knew i was ready and that was like my my moment where i was like yeah like just just more more so pumped than anything um and then once I had the fight, that just instilled it more that I was ready for it. And I was like, I was uh, where I wanted to be. And now it was time to really uh, show what I can do. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess another thing that a lot of people talk about is like making the UFC is one thing, but then making a career out of being in the UFC is another thing. And like yeah. after that performance and like you've had, three awesome fights like regardless of like the results they're all awesome fights and you got the result that you deserve that last one what is it that you're doing like what is it you said you quit your job you're doing this full time like what is it that you're doing to make sure that you are going to have this long career in the usc and you're going to be able to build this platform and you know be able to live the rest of your life the way that you want to do it what are you doing because of that yeah well that, that's exactly it mate like no, I don't think any fighter sort of feel, oh, I know I don't. 
I don't feel like I've made it because I'm always pushing to go more. And exactly what you said, fighting in the, making the UFC and staying in the UFC are, are two different things. So, <clears throat> yeah, what I'm doing is I'm seeking out the best training that I possibly can. And the people around me, like the people that I have around me, like Ross Pierce, and he's ideal because he has lived that life. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's lived that life and he can tell me firsthand how the UFC works, uh, what you do expect. And the, he, he'd be the first one to sort of pull, pull my head in and say, don't think for a second that, <laughs> you know, you've, you've made it because we've got, we got work to do. Um, so just having the right people around me and um, the competition itself, that, that speaks for itself, that lightweight uh, UFC division. Um, you, can't, you can't take your foot off the gas. You know what I mean? You've, you've got to be uh, ready to go because um, the, the competition's tough and I want to I want to be the best. So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's keeping me driven to uh, stay in the UFC, obviously. Yeah, 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 for sure. And um, I guess, Jamie, like the, the, the next thing is like, you just mentioned it then, you're surrounding yourself with these people, right? And whether people know it or not, like you've gone down and you've trained with Volk and you've put in, like you've immersed yourself in that training environment and, and, and we'll get Volk on, we'll talk about him, whatever. But like that training environment is intense. Like I work with lots of gyms, pretty much all the gyms across Australia and New Zealand. And there's a, there's a real disparity, not disparity, but real difference between training intensities. That's very obvious and freestyle fighting and same with like city kickboxing that training environment that they're in is full on. Like it, it's full yeah. on like where, where like sports scientists have argued with me, oh, these guys are overtraining, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, well, yeah, maybe, but like look at the results that they're getting. So maybe we need yeah, to yeah. shift our, our perspective of what that is and, you know, within the sport, blah, blah, blah. How important has that been for you? How important has that been immersing yourself in that training environment, putting yourself around people like Volk, around Joe, around the other guys and, what has that done for you as an athlete, do you think? Yeah, it's been great. Um, like I, I think that you have to train with other people in general to, um, to expand, like to, to, to make yourself better, to expand your knowledge of the sport, uh, to see other ways of training. Because if you stay just doing the same old, the same thing over and over and over, I think you become a little bit stagnant. Um, yeah. with your training, uh, with things you're doing. So um, it's it's a big learning curve. Uh, and you also have, I think, touching on that, like it's, it's everyone trains hard, right? Like everyone, yeah. we, all, we all do that. Um, but then training with the right people, like that are, motivated with you that are not going to be dicks and um and fucking try and hurt you inspiring so like what volk did was for his first fight with max his first defense against max he uh got a crew of us and um with the pandemic he wasn't able to leave his leave his uh gym and you i think usually he goes and trains with the city kickboxing boys so he couldn't leave and <clears throat> he got a crew of us together and it was like the perfect like sort of crew of uh, Australian fighters. We had like I'll probably misname so I don't know, but we had like myself, Josh Coolabow, Blake Donnelly, Trent Gurdon, uh, Brenton Mumford, Alan Philpot, uh, Colby Thickness. Just a murderous little row of of fighters from around Australia, and Volk brought them all to him. So, and then we all just trained hard on the same path great sparring partners no fucking no no dickheads in the in the group so we all uh we all just put our heads down and um that environment sort of helps so much just having the the, the right guys around you and uh just got, getting in good training yeah yeah for sure man that's awesome it's crazy that that whole thing when you guys set that up was so cool to see from the outside because 
it, it's funny boxing's very much like that in australia i find it's very clicky and everyone kind of stands like in their own little corner and it's like they'd never integrate and, and cross train with each other whereas like mma i think you guys prove that it's like it's more of a Australia versus, you know, the world type thing when you guys did that, even though, you know, even though, you know, you guys, there's guys there that could potentially compete. Like you got Josh and Volk who are both in the featherweight division, right? Like you got yourself, you got Mumford, you got Blake who are all lightweight. So it's like, but you guys all come together. And I remember when I went down and saw that, I remember talking to Joe about it going like, holy crap this is insane. Like this is what Australian MMA needs. Like this is the most elite guys yeah. in Australia all pushing each other. Like this is scary. Like it's scary what this is going to do for every single one of these fighters. And you saw that, man, you saw how you guys yeah. just elevated each other. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that's hats off to Volko. Um, I said it to him, like he, he made that all happen. Cause I'd never, um, I'd never really trained with, I, like I've, I've got like Josh, uh, Cody Freeman was another one that was there with us, a uh, high-level guy. So I had, like, a few different guys that I trained with. Like, I'd go to them or they'd come to my gym so we, to, eat, to help each other out. Because at this level, it's what you got to do, right? Like, you got to seek the best training possible. And then Volk, by doing what he did, and he brought everyone in this little circle. And it was, like, it was in a crazy time, too. It was in COVID. So yeah. most gyms weren't even able to train at that point. But we got, uh, Alex got an exemption from the Australian government to, for us to legally train uh, where we had to get COVID tested. And um, so it was pretty crazy. And in that time, like it was funny how in the time where not many gyms could train, we had the, like the best, <laughs> the best <train>. possible <laughs> camp. It was crazy. And it, yeah, exactly what you said. You see how much it elevated everyone. Like, a, a, like learning off each other, pushing each other. There was not one easy round. So I think um, it was like an eye opener. That's that's kind of what you have to do at this level. And I think all the boys that were in that camp were all like mature enough. There's no egos. Yeah. To be like, oh, like I'm against this guy. I'm against this guy. Yeah. Like. We all kind of put that behind it and went, like, let's all fucking train and help each other. And um, if I reckon if even some of the boys, some of the lads got matched up against each other, they'd be like, yeah, cool, we'll fucking fight. Who cares? We're, we're, we're helping each other anyway. We're, we're getting better. So that's that's what that did for us, I reckon. And it uh, just showed us how, how much better it can get when you just push that shit aside and, and just train with each other. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Man, the, I, I want to finish this podcast with, uh, I'm going to say, five rapid-fire questions that I want to give you. But before we get into that, what's next? What's next for the hooligan? What do you got planned? Obviously, like we were talking about at the start, it's a weird time with COVID, taking corners everywhere. What's next? What, what do you want to do? Do you want to get back home, like slowly get back into training? Are you training now in the hotel? When do you want to fight next? What's next? Yeah, what's next? I reckon... Um... I'll get home and man, I, I'm ready to go straight away again. I, I want to, I, I think I've got like some uh, lost time to make up for. So I want to get uh, my hands a little bit. Um, I had a bit of a injury so, sort of coming in and um, it sort of hurt, hurt more in the flight. So I'll get that fixed up. And when I'm healthy and good to go um, like this, like we were just saying, this is uh, my job now, so I'm I'm ready to to answer the call and go again as as soon as possible. I'd I'd love to be fighting, uh, sort of ju- June July again, if I can. That's that's what's next, and I'll I'll fight anyone they give me. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well, June July International Fight Week, right? Like it's uh it's always a big time for the UFC, so very very high yep. possibility that'll happen. Let's, uh, let's get into these rapid-fire questions, though. Uh, the hooligan, let's fire him off. Favourite UFC fighter of all time? Forrest Griffin. Forrest Griffin. Did you meet Forrest when you... You've met Forrest when you were at the PIA? Nah, nah, I didn't. <laughs> I oh, scary. yeah, man. Man, I was actually on a podcast and someone asked me, they were like, What's the, who's the coolest person, like the coolest person that you've met? And I said Forrest because I had this whole oh, idea yeah. of Forrest 
beforehand, like watching the ultimate fighter. And he was the only guy that I was like, kind of nervous to meet. And then when I met him, I was like, man, this guy's the coolest dude. And he's like hella funny <laughs> too. But he's like, he's such a presence about him when you meet him. Hey, you're like, even if yeah. you didn't know that was Forrest Griffin, you'd know it was Forrest Griffin just because of the aura that he has about him. But yeah, that's awesome. But Favorite OJ, quote uh, that you live by. Favorite quote that you live by. Uh, what is it? Fail to prepare, then prepare to fail. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, most influential person that you have in your life. Um, no, Magnus, my my oh, coach. Okay. He's uh, he's been there from day one, and he does like he just kills life. He met. The best thing about Noel Magnus is he doesn't produce good fighters. He produces good men. Yeah, that's awesome. What what influence do you reckon that's had on you coming up? Like, do you think you'd be on a different trajectory, trajectory, sorry, if Noah wasn't your coach all those years ago when you came through as a little shit-kicking teenager? Yeah, yeah, man, 100%. He's had every influence, not just uh, what's the what's the biggest influence he's had every influence and just guided me through through all, all those years that we were talking about where i'm a teenager working um training he he guided me through all that like every step of the way so it would be a very different outcome if i didn't know him from from day one yeah yeah for sure <clears throat> all right all right next one what's the first thing you do after you finish your fight, you've just come off eight weeks camp, you've been dieting, you've been cutting weight, you just jumped in the cage, punched on with someone. What's the first thing you want to do after you finish fighting? A schooner or two is new with the boys. <laughs> That's awesome. Or a few, uh, a few whiskeys in Vegas, hey, hey Jamie? Yeah, boy. <laughs> All right, very last question. Advice for young fighters who want to make it. Um, that's, oh, that's a good one. Cause my first advice, well, my, my first advice to people training and like, enjoy your training. Cause if you're not enjoying your training, then what are you doing it for? Like, that's, that's my, my first advice. Um, you should be like having fun with what you're doing. Um, and my second advice, uh, like, cause I've, I've just kind of like thought about this a lot with up and comers, like in the in this day and age, it's all about social media and shit. Um, put down your fucking phone and just train. <laughs> that's that's some of my advice. Like you, you'd agree. Like you don't. I, I, I'm a like. I'm not a social media kind of guy. I've, I've gotten better at it. Like I'm doing more posts and all that shit. But I just think that young guys are getting a little bit too caught up in doing a selfie every single every single session of the day like no one cares you don't have to do a post a day about your about your training and hashtags and all that shit just fucking focus on your craft uh darren till said it best he said focus on your craft and uh and then the rest will come so yeah. No, that's my nice. little rant. That's my how's that little rant, eh? Just, yeah. little rant about <laughs> just, just put putting people on the spot, hey. Just there's a few <laughs> there's a few guys right now on their phones just putting their phones down, listening to this going, Oh man, Jamie just said that. <laughs> but nah, Jamie, I appreciate you coming on, man, because the reason I wanted to start this podcast and do this is because what people don't understand, and I, I think like when people exactly what you just said people see social media and they see that side of it, but they don't see the work. And I think being, you know, as close to you guys as I am and and having the relationship that we do have, I get to see it. I get to see it firsthand, what you guys go through, what you put yourself in. And and more importantly, what you guys sacrifice to make that walk into the cage and everything that you guys do. And it's, it's difficult for me not to be motivated. It's difficult for me not to want to do better. And it's difficult for me not to want to be the best in my business or the best at what I do when I'm hanging around people like you guys all the time. And that's what I want to get across with this podcast is let people see that side and let, let that get out. And hopefully they take a bit of inspiration. And that's the whole thing is like unraveling high performance for you. And I think what I got most out of that chat is there's probably five things that Jamie Malarkey does for high performance. And that's a huge level of self-belief, huge, huge level of self-belief in yourself. You visualize where you want to be and you've done that since you were 14, 15, always challenging yourself, never shy away. And I think your first three fights in the UFC, 
I think no one can question that. You've put yourself up the highest against the challenge, highest caliber of challenge rather. Have good role models in your life like you have with Noah through since yes. you were a young, young guy coming up through and then having Ross Pearson and then, again, putting yourself in that situation with Volkanovski and the freestyle fighting guys where you've done that. Yeah. And then most importantly, put your phone down and do the work. Get the work done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, spot sure. on. Well, Jamie, thanks so much for coming on, bro. I would say uh, I know you're a busy guy and you got lots of time, but you and I right now got nothing but time. So maybe we'll do another <laughs> one of these before we get out of quarantine. But Jamie, any last words before, bro. We, uh, before we let you go? No, nah, just thanks for having us on. Thanks for everyone that believes in me. And let's, uh, let's go again. Yeah, for sure. Now, lastly, before I do let you go, people listening here, they'll go, oh man, Jamie's a cool dude. I want to follow him. I want to make sure I don't miss anything that he does. Can you give us a yell where they can follow you on socials? You know, how they can get, if they say, oh man, I want to, I want to, you know, get in contact with Jamie. Is there a way they can get in contact with you, follow you on socials? Give us the spiel. Yeah. uh, Instagram, Jamie underscore Malarkey. Follow me on there and keep up to date with what I'm doing. And um yeah if you want to flick us a message i'll i'll try get back to you and uh yeah that's that's where that's where i'm at i'm not a big again i'm not a big on uh, social media so i'm not like uh yeah you know I'll, chances are i'll probably be a boring cunt to follow and um <laughs> but that's that's what it is so hey. nah that's that's where i'm at quite quite the opposite i reckon jamie not not boring in the slightest <laughs> but all right, man, I'm going to call this one here, but thank you so much, man, for, for taking the time. And I'm sure there's so many good lessons that guys will get out of this just from listening to this. So thanks so much, bro. Legend, Jordy. Cheers, bro.